time. Matthew 28. Okay. Verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All of our dust would pass given unto me in heaven and in earth. Then 19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now we said that this uh, is the will of God, what you can call, people call it the Great Commission, but uh, yes, it's the Great Commission, but it's actually God's will for all believers. It's an instruction. And I said it earlier in the last two services, if God gives you an instruction, you're still praying about it, to know what to do, then you're going to get confusion. When you have light and you're looking for light, you're going to get into confusion. And the written word already shows you the will of God. Go into all the world. or uh, make, Go in therefore and make disciples of every nation. And that is God's will for every believer. It means to Matthew 2 or in the Greek, which you're going to find in Matthew 13, 52, and Matthew 27 and 57. I said 67 in the first service. 57. It means to train people up, to school them. Now, the, the peculiar instance in Matthew 13, 52, is that it refers to educated people, the scribes. So imagine having to school a professor to retrain him. In Matthew 27, you have Joseph of Arimathea, a ruler, a respectable person, an influential elite, a well-established citizen, that you have to retrain him. So discipleship is not about the children's church, or about um, some young folks in the universities. No, it's about all men, all kinds of people that we have to train, bring up, raise, right? retrain them, re-educate them with the gospel. So that's where the will of God is for your life. And I said this in the last two services, I'm going to repeat myself. And, you know, someone made this statement. And he said things, I know, you know, I just said it now, that if you have God's word written like this, and you're looking for God's will, you're going to get confusion. God's word is very clear. A dear lady told me, she said, well, uh, this fellow is asking me out whether we could date, then marry, but he's not a believer. What can I do? I said, what kind of stupid question is that? That's a stupid question. You know the Bible, right? Yeah. You know it's clear in Scripture that you can't be unequally your girl unbeliever. Yeah, but I'm just thinking. Thinking what? Can I pray about it? Go and pray. The devil's going to hear you. Because when you have light and you're looking for light, you're going to get darkness. You know, I was saying this in the last time, it's just that someone now made a statement, he said, well, some people are, uh, you know, and there's kind of disrespect people have for God's word. So much disrespect. Many times when I teach in the Bible schools that I do teach, whether, you know, formally, like sitting, or I have to teach them also across the internet. One of the things I say is I say, you know, everybody, hold your Bible, they hold there. I said, look, this is what is peculiar to Christianity. I tell them all the time. I say, remove this Bible from our classes. What do we have? Nothing. Take it out of the service. Imagine if we all came to this service without Bibles. Well, some do. No Bibles. And I'm not reading from it. I'm not talking about it. And we just come and say, hey, 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 basic, basic. And we sing very good songs, and we go. You can't call that church, you know why? Because you did not teach from the scriptures. And so this fellow said, well, a man can have signs and wonders. He may not have the word. He may not have the word. You know, some people are prophets, so they are not teachers. People say it so easily today. Sometimes you feel like, excuse me, what did you just say? They are, they are not teachers. They are prophets. They are not into all these um, exegesis. They mock those who teach God's word. Then all this explanation, explanation, ah, ah. Somebody told me one time, he said, ah, ah, Yusuf, you can dot the I and cross the T of the old Bible. He thought he was saying something mockery. I said, I said, you add to it. <laughs> At least I make it readable. You make it unreadable. <laughs> you know, people like that, they're very funny. He said, you know, the man may not have the word, but he has the 
power of the Holy Spirit. So I say, prophet, nonsense. A prophet is a teacher of God's word. A prophet is not a seer. I've said it. This is the first time I'm going to say it in 24 hours. A prophet is not a seer. A prophet does see. But that is not his office primarily. The word prophet is from the Hebrew word Nabai. N-A-B-I. Where you have prophesied Naba. N-A-B-A. And that word simply means spokesperson. Somebody who speaks. A prophet is known by what he preaches. So you have Abraham, Genesis 20 verse 7, he is called a prophet of God. Now, go to Deuteronomy 13, this is Deuteronomy 13 verse 1. Go there quickly, we were there last week I think. Deuteronomy 13 verse 1, quickly. Moses, whom Jesus referred to a good number of times, Moses gives a warning. Look at it. He said, if there be a prophet or a dreamer of dreams. You know, because many of us, we have, we have, a, we have a modern interpretation of Bible words that's not, that not original. When it's a prophet, the first thing that comes to our minds is somebody who sees visions. Yeah. A prophet does see visions, but that is not what a prophet is. So here is Moses, and you know the importance about the importance of this uh, importance of this information in Deuteronomy 13 is that where the children of Israel grew in Egypt, they had a lot of prophets, prophets of the gods of the land. They had those, and they usually used to hold them spellbound. With miracles, signs and wonders. Remember when the, the plagues, you know, the magicians, for some of the miracles that Moses did, they did the same thing. Right? Come on. The same thing. So th that was the environment they were in. Very, very similar environment. So he begins to tell them how to know the difference. He says, somebody comes, he dreams, and he gives a sign and wonder, and he says, it comes to pass. Is that not there? And it comes to pass. Say, hey, that man. You know, everybody say, my Egbono. Ah, authentic man of God. Why? Because he tells you your problems. Tells you your problems. Say, hmm. You say, you are in Nigeria. Somebody's already telling you, you have a problem. <laughs> Who doesn't have a problem? You, don't you have a problem? Man of God. Maybe it's money. <laughs> and Moses says the man gives a prophecy, a vision comes to pass. He says, then, he now tells you to follow other gods. Not to obey God's word. He tells you, not, not to, you know, he tells them, lest you do it after the service, to stone it equates that to murder. The worst crime. Land of Israel then, because you know, Moses was not just a pastor. He was also like a prime minister. He was like a, a government official, a, a head of government. So he usually will give, okay. So he says, the guy, he comes to pass. And he says, and he comes to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of us, you can, so get, get kind of, yeah, hey, hey. I remember one time in Ikuru, 1990. We come with myself and my cousins, and we found one guy. The guy used to be called um, um, Chris Lamhap. Christian Islam Abal. You never heard about him. 31 years ago, at, um, let me remember that place again. Where's that place that we have the cinema? Sharif. Oh, I didn't know where I was that. Okay, I've said the story before. Okay, Sharif. That's behind Holy Trinity. Okay, so he was holding. Uh, is that his service? Well, it was like a crusade. He was singing church songs. Then he would sing some church songs. Then he would sing, uh, he would sing, uh, then he also say, uh, then you now come to uh, um, 
All the other songs, you know, from the other side. All together. So he did a miracle. A very outstanding In fact, my cousin said, Yeah, Jesus! <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, when you see magic, I say, Jesus! You know, that means you were captivated. I said, wow. And it was such a standing miracle. A human being turned to something in our eyes. Then turned back. And I said, ah. And I remember I had this uh, senior in government college. He's late now. He was the son of the professor Pella. He was my senior. I was his mess boy. Remember mess boy? That tell the meaning? Okay, he, I was his mess boy. So, one time he called me. He asked me whether I gave him the right portion of dodo. I said I did. He said he wants to show me something. So that I will not lie to him. <laughs> so, he did, a, he did one magic right in my presence. He said, go and bring that body. He said, go and put it back, put it back. I saw it with him again. He said, ah. he said I'm warning you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I said, wow. There was one day like that, um, 1989, I think. He was supposed to be the, um, well, I think the end of year something. And yeah, so he was the one that was supposed to, you know, uh, maybe practice something. So he, as he came in, started to ring. He was my senior. Ooh. Then he just brought out uh, like a stick. You know, you know, you heard about his dad? His dad cut the mom into two and brought her back. That's what we thought happened. You know, it happened here in Lagos and nobody has disputed it. And so, he, he just brought out that stuff and he became a bird. And we looked at the bird, he took it again because said, hey, Pella, Pella. So we used to fear him. See, one guy came, Egbo Samson. <laughs> <laughs> you know why I'm telling the story right now? Yesterday night, many of my classmates, we, went, we did a reminiscing of many of those stories. And then Egbo Samson, so people used to fear him because of the magic. That guy beat the hell, Hades, <laughs> she all out of him. He beat him law. I said, ah. That day, the fear of Pella left my heart. So, <laughs> ah, ah, with all your magic. They beat you. He beat him there, Greyhound. Hall. And he was going, ah, with the magic. Said, <laughs> so, when I saw that Chris, Chris Lamhab guy, I said, ah, they will still beat you too. You know? But the point was, he got people captivated. You see, Chris says, ah. <laughs> <laughs> God's got power. You know, but you are not an idol worshiper. Is that very clear? Is that clear? Praise the Lord. Moses said, that kind of, you reject it. A prophet is a preacher of scriptures. Then we'll take his visions. Before I take his visions, I listen to what he says about the word. Are you in church? Do you know, before, before Jeremiah, sorry, before Daniel gave a vision about the liberation of Israel. He said, I understood by the scriptures. Daniel 9, 3. A prophet, Nabai, is a speaker of God's word. Just like Aaron, who was the brother of Moses, was his Nabai, his spokesperson. So when Jesus said, O oh, fool, slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to suffer this in 10 times to his glory, Luke 24 and verse 26. Begin at Moses and all the prophets, he expands to them in all the scriptures. So prophet is a preacher of scriptures who also reveals things. But he is first what? A preacher of scriptures. Don't put the horse, I mean the cart, before the us. The ministry of the word first before the visions of revelation. That's why many people have gotten their lives twisted, wasted, and confused because they took men because of those signs and wonders. And they go for all sorts of, all, all kind of places. People begin to see things about you. I think you have a serpentine spirit. I think you have a serpentine spirit. I think you they say, hmm, hmm. And then they say, you know, I know what happened to you, and they begin to tell you different things about you. He said, what, 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 why did you see? He said, <laughs> and the guy's a false prophet. 
But because you are so used to getting captivated. Now, this is in no way discouraging you from embracing the supernatural. But super, embrace the supernatural with discernment. Is that clear? We have a strong ministry of the supernatural. We do emphasize the movement of the Holy Ghost. We have books we've written that's blessed the body of Christ, both here and abroad. We've, we've done that. We teach that. We have meetings every year of the supernatural. But we put emphasis on the word because, you see, if people put emphasis on the supernatural, listen to me, the demonstration of miracles and signs and wonders is not peculiar to Christianity. I told you last week. What is peculiar to Christianity is the revelation of Jesus Christ through the word. Is that okay? Is that okay? So you mu- there's nothing that should r- remove your discernment. Discernment is not arrogance. It's only a baby who puts everything in his mouth as food, right? Come on. Discernment is not arrogance. Don't let anybody think you're arrogant. Discernment is maturity. Someone told me, he said, I used to go for this uh, stuff and they used to do this for me. And he said, but I just heard you for three months. And I heard that thing again and I said, what nonsense. I said, you're sounding arrogant, right? That's how discernment looks like. Because now you're informed. Hallelujah. Looks like you're arrogant, but you're not. You just know what you're saying. One time, I was in a tutorial class. I was um, in a tutorial class, then just left secondary school. So we had this class, and then the lecturer wrote something, the teacher, and I was in the class. I said, you're wrong, sir. Everybody looked back. Huh? He said, come and take it, and come and take it, and he felt I was going to be intimidated. I just got the, took the duster, and cleaned everything he wrote. And I wrote it again. He said, ah. You know, I, I just put it in and I went back to sit down. So he was looking at me. He said, what school are you from? <laughs> you are looking for pride. <laughs> I gave it to him. I said, GCI, Government College of Ballet. I said, oh, that's good. Yes, yeah. So they then I asked him, what do we do? He said, ah, write what he has said. <laughs> <laughs> so really, you can look like you're arrogant, but you're not arrogant. You just know what you are saying. Amen. I once told someone, I said, you are righteous. He said, I'm not righteous. Shut up, you're righteous. He said, I said, I'm not righteous. You're righteous. <laughs> <laughs> Brother Aziz, I'll never forget. Brother Aziz said, no, I have to die to say, I said, you're not dying anywhere. You are here and you're righteous. You have the blood of Jesus. He said, no, don't you say you're righteous. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, when you first get a hold of the word, you are just, it's all over you. Amen. You just be like, why is everybody not knowing this? Why? Why? <laughs> Until you are discouraged the first time. <laughs> are you in church? So, therefore, we have a duty to be students of the word. Is that clear? Okay, Mark 16. Learning something? You learning something? Mark 16, 15. Right, good. It says in 15, <clears throat> and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The gospel. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. This sign shall follow them that believe in my name. We're going to do that in a moment. They shall cast out demons, as the word devils, and speak with new tongues. Verse 18. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly things, shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they, the sick, shall recover. So after that, the Lord has spoken unto them, he was shifted unto heaven, and sat on the right hand of God. 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord walking with them, and confirming the word with signs following. Which means, just like we said, we preach the word and their signs. We have a duty to announce the word. To make sure we have conversations during the week that make people know Jesus and welcome him into their heart by faith. As their Lord and Savior. Look at that. And so, therefore, this is the will of God for you. When you read this, it's the will of God for you. John 20, John 20, and 21. John's Gospel, chapter 20, and verse 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Verse 22, and when he had said this, he breathed on them, and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. 
Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Which means, because of the indwelling of the Holy Ghost and the outpouring of the Holy Ghost both ways, we are now in God's stead. He's the one who forgives. Okay? And is the one who retains when a man refuses his grace. And now we are in the stead of God, okay, to act as his agents in the earth. Or he is in our stead, you know, doing his will. So the question is, do you engage in this? When you're able to tell someone your sins are forgiven you. This is a, this is a mandate. You, so I say, well, you, now you are saved. You know, you just preach to someone and he says, thank you, Sasha. You know, now you are in the family of God. That is a mandate. That's an authority you have in Christ Jesus to pronounce men born again. To pronounce them healed. You know, we, we, we don't mind saying, you are healed in Jesus' name. And we say, ah, well, I say you are forgiven now. That is an authority we have. Hallelujah. Say, so I have an authority in the name of Jesus to pronounce men forgiven saved and sanctified. Hallelujah. It's a mandate you have. It's an authority you have. Amen? Amen? Look, Luke's Gospel 24. We were there earlier on. Luke's Gospel 24. We're looking at the name of Jesus. Luke's Gospel 24 and 25. And when he had said unto them, <clears throat> and then he said to them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory. And beginning at Moses 27 and all the prophets, he expounded, which means it interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now let's key into that. We have said that the Bible of Jesus is Genesis to Malachi. Now, I'm going to repeat it again, again, and again. That that dichotomy you have in your Bible. Now let me see yours. Thank you. Now, this is a holy Bible. Yeah, it's written like that. Okay, good. All right, so this is a Bible uh, to satisfy many things. So you have <laughs> the books of the Bible. Now, first thing it says, Old Testament. Starts from Genesis, ends in Malachi. It's a New Testament. Of course, who goes for something that's old when you have new stuff? Nobody does that. So you say, we are not in the Old Testament we are in the New Testament. Of course, who won't like that? They're shorter. All right? New Testament books are shorter. Right? So you like it. Say, I like this one. Straightforward. You know? And, and so, in our minds, we have replaced the Old Testament book with the New Testament. I've told you before, nobody called Genesis to Malachi Old Testament in the Bible. Not Jesus. Not the apostles. And no one called Genesis... Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John through to Revelation New Testament. New Testament, right, and Old Testament, we said that last week, refers to certain things in Scripture. What you, are, what you call Genesis to Malachi is the Word of God. Now, listen to this very carefully. Now, I'm saying this again for emphasis. Paul never wrote letters so that we can replace Genesis to Malachi with his letters. No. The reason for the epistles was because of the absence of the writers. They did not write epistles while they were there. Meanwhile, this is critical, guys, Moses wrote the scriptures to them when he was there. Same as Isaiah and David and Solomon. But the apostles wrote in their absence. That's why they sent it through someone to deliver it. They weren't there. So, normally, when they hold services, what they will have in their hands are 39 books, precisely, predominantly. Genesis to Malachi. And they will teach from there. Now, where Paul is absent or is in jail, as in the case of Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, first, uh, Second Timothy, <clears throat> and uh, Philemon. He wrote them letters. As when he wasn't there, First Thessalonians, in Second Thessalonians, he wrote them letters. In Galatians, he wasn't there. Send them a letter. In Romans, he said, I'll still come. 
But before I come, read this. Which means that in the place of teaching the scriptures, the letters took their place till they arrived. Or where they asked them questions and they were not physically present, they used those letters to yet again explain the scriptures to them. So the letters were not replacements, they were explanations. Let me see if you understand that. Is it clear? Is that very clear? So we mustn't get the habit or have the habit of reading the epistles without the books of Genesis to Malachi. They must be read together. So near me, Luke 24 and 44. These are the words which I said to you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled. Luke 24, 44, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. 45, then he opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. The word understand, the second word, is so near me. To read and reason together, okay? S-U-N-I-E-M-I. Two words, son, S-U-N, together, and nohima, N-O-E-M-A, to read or reason together. Then people have asked oftentimes, then why then do we seem to have a difference between what we call the Old Testament and the New Testament? I said, there's no difference. You only need to interpret it. If you interpret Genesis to Malachi, what you will get is Matthew to Revelation. Without Genesis to Malachi, you can't have Gen Matthew to Revelation. Matthew to Revelation is an explanation of Genesis to Malachi. And you will need to read Genesis to Malachi to understand Matthew to Revelation. So the first thing we need to deal with in knowing the name of Jesus here is to remove that dichotomy. I'm not under the Old Testament. I'm under the New Testament. So what do you mean? So ah, Old Testament is not for me. Uh, New Testament is for me. Say so why? Uh, that's what he's using to me. So okay, wait. Are you in Corinth or Rome or Ephesus? No. Wasn't written to you either. But both the Old Testament books, as we call them, and the epistles were written for you. For you. Romans five fourteen or fifteen four. Sorry, the things that. We're written at four time, we're written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of scriptures might have hope. So they were written for doctrine. Second Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. So I must learn them as doctrine. Say the Old Testament books, Genesis to Malachi, is doctrine to me. Say, it's doctrine to me. Say, it's doctrine to me. It's persuasive for me. It is correction for me. It's an instruction for spiritual growth for me. Let's take it again. Genesis to Malachi. It's doctrine to me. Say it again. Genesis to Malachi. It's doctrine to me. It is persuasive for me. It is corrective for me. It is instructive for me to grow spiritually. That is what it's for. Hallelujah. So now, the name of Jesus, now let me add this, everything Jesus said, he taught from where? Huh? All he did, he did from where? Okay, so last week and the week before, we looked at the uniqueness of his name. Remember that? Okay, so we said that he bore Yeshua deliberately. Why was he given the name Jesus? Jesus is Yeshua. Two words, Yahweh and Yesha. God who delivers. The name of Joshua is the same name. Now I said the importance of Joshua is this. Pay attention. Last week we looked at New Covenant. Okay? So we said New Covenant is what? Which book? Eh? Huh? Why? Because they failed in numbers. So who was the new covenant messenger? Joshua. Because in numbers, Moses knew he wasn't going with them. 
So Joshua is a new covenant messenger. So in Malachi 3, 1, where Malachi speaks about a messenger will go before the face of the Lord, by the way, which is John the Baptist, who will come to the messenger of the covenant. That is Joshua. So Jesus is the new Joshua. God renewing his promise. So when he was given that name, don't forget again we saw that John went to Jordan, remember that? Deliberately, why? Jordan was the entry point to the land, right? So why does he go to Jordan? Because there is a new exodus. Is that clear? A new covenant. God is renewing his word in spite of their failures, in spite of them breaking it down. In the earlier services, I explained that in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 32. Jeremiah said, this is the new covenant, not according to what happened in Numbers. In verse 32 and 33. When I took them by the end, and he says they did not continue. They broke my covenant. So Jeremiah is again in a situation Moses found himself. Again, Israel has broken the covenant. And God renews it again. That my word will not fail. He gives them the covenant. And what is the new covenant? New covenant is God dealing with what? The heart. He said that. So Jesus, so John the Baptist, goes to Jordan. And he stands at Jordan. And he demonstrates Jordan as a baptism. Exactly what Israel did. They went through the waters. John is saying, God is renewing his promise. They are in the land, but they are not in God's promise. He's saying, God will fulfill what he has said. I know you have tyranny now. I know you have a kingdom over you. You have idolatry, sin. You have a broken religious system. The worship is confusing. But God is renewing his covenant. It takes them to the windows, or call it the el el emblems, or the figures of speech. The Red Sea, no, I mean the Jordan River. Then begins to baptize. Takes them to the desert, and then they begin to baptize. And Jesus shows up. And he says, no, you do it. Yeah, I said, no, to fulfill all righteousness. And here's John. John, listen carefully now, puts Jesus in the water. That's typical of the Red Sea, right? Crossing, right? Now, don't forget, they left behind in the Red Sea, Pharaoh and his chariots. That's death, right? Come on, the enemy. And then he comes out. But something unique. John now sees the Holy Ghost on Jesus. That's something Jesus will do in the resurrection. He which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. John says, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the whole world. So John is telling us that in the new covenant through Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost will be given. Amen? Amen? What is the Holy Ghost? I'm giving you a very quick study, okay? <laughs> you know, we move from Garden of Eden, right? Come on, to the land given to Abraham. And we said all those things are windows. What is in Garden of Eden? The tree of life. The spirit. What did God promise Abraham? It's not a portion of land. No, he said the whole earth. And he told him, Genesis 17, 1, I am the shadi, I am the land. So God gave himself to Abraham as a, like a gift of land. And how mighty is that gift? In the whole earth. So as we proceed further, we get to the prophets and David. They now talk about the kingdom of God. Is that clear? So we have moved from using land, right, to kingdom, and then God will give his spirit. Is that clear? So whether it's land or kingdom or spirit, they describe who? God. Who is the gift? God himself. And the fulfillment of that I showed you that yesterday is that when they got to the land, what's the essence? They now built a temple, and then the work is done. So God's temple, which is the whole earth, is being built as we speak. That's why we go for evangelism. That's why people get born again. This is the gift that was given. 
So John stands at Jordan and says, this is the time. Malachi said it. Isaiah said it. Isaiah 40 verse 3 said, behold Israel your God. Isaiah 40 verse 8 and 9 and 10. So John says, this is the one. He says, he's mightier than I. He says, the shoes of his feet, I'm not worthy to untie. I baptize with water, heal with the Holy Ghost and with fire. John says that. So Jesus was given a name that was reserved for the new covenant. Who's following this? Come on, let me see your hand. Is this making sense? All right, good. We said that last week. Isaiah would say, a virgin shall conceive, Isaiah 7, 14, and bring forth a son or a child, and his name shall be Emmanuel. And don't forget, that was the name of one of Isaiah's sons. So people bore those names before Jesus. But they were pointers, signboards to the reality. Who's following this? Come on. Are you there? God with us. Now, so Jesus didn't bear a name that no one had ever gotten. That is, in, uh, no. Now it's time to find out whether he is the fulfillment or just another signboard. Are you getting that? Is he the fulfillment or is he another sign? Here we are. So in his resurrection, when he rose from the dead, okay, something all the prophet has said, and the guy who was on the cross, the male factor who was the criminal, he says something to Jesus. He's condemned by men. That's why we mustn't use people's views to view people. I'm, I'm aware, for example, there are two people I'll hide their names because I don't want unnecessary publicity for them. Who people believed that they died as either atheists or idol worshippers. I know the two persons, prominent Nigerians. That everybody would say, ah! In fact, when they mention one of them, one of the names, they say, ah! He's inside a fire. The depths. The one that doesn't just burn. That one. But I'm aware how someone I know that I trust said they met in London. And he sat down and witnessed the gospel to him. And he believed. Said so he didn't just believe. I gave him Bible study. Less than a week he passed on it. I know another person like that. But if you read their stories today, you'll say, ah, Hell has people. I know another person who I don't want to mention again, who is another prominent person. This one's in the whole world. In fact, you can use the example today as people who became famous and died in and went to hell. You can see if I you can even say it tomorrow in evangelism. But he is in the book of life. I know. So Jesus told that story because. Naturally, in that land, if you say, that guy, can, let, let's mention his name, let's say his name is Anini. Do you know Anini? 1980, I think that's 86 or so. That guy was so ferocious in Nigeria that the president of Nigeria, that's uh, Ibrahim Babangida then, publicly on television, was talking to the um, um, Eltim Iyang then, who was the uh, inspector general of police. And in, on national television, he said, IG, where is Anini? On national TV. It was the next week they caught the guy. You know, and then they, so, so, so everybody there is Anini. Ah, hey. You know, and in Lagos, he's not here. People are already afraid of him here. Ah, what a glory that filled the earth. <laughs> so what is Anini? Hey. If that's the guy's name. Now who knows? Anini might have received Christ Jesus. You don't know. See what I'm doing too. Now so. So, he's on the cross. I'm sure people have condemned him. Someone has said, I preached to him. And I preached to him, oh, see his life. After preaching to him, see where he ends up. And then he's the only one 
on the cross. Jesus told us that story deliberately. Because the disciples were not there. It's no eyewitness. They ran away. And he told them. He said, Lord, remember me when you get into your kingdom. Basilio is not used for death. It's used for life. The man knew that Jesus would be raised from the dead. Are you there? The other people mocked him. But he didn't. So now, pay attention here. So Jesus, in that resurrection, now began to teach them the things concerning himself. Now, notice what he does on the road to Emmaus. Very unique. He describes himself as a third party, like a third party. I remember they said, we had waited, they didn't know it was him, you know. He said, oh, oh, fools, slow apart, to believe all the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ, as though he's talking about somebody else, to have suffered these things that you saw, and then to enter into his glory. Then he began to explain the things concerning himself. Where did he explain it from? Huh? Now put it there. Put it there. He began to explain the things concerning his name. Put it there. His name. Why was he given that name? He began to explain to them that I was given that name because of the things I will suffer and the glory afterwards. So, at some point, when he began to Heat with them, their eyes opened. Then he vanished out of their sight. Then they said, Did our heart not burn? <coughs> Verse 32. As he opened to us the scriptures, Luke 24. Then when he came in again, in the larger crowd, larger number, and he says, Peace unto you. Then they said, Wow. He says, Don't be afraid. Touch me. A spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see me have. Then he took food with them. Then he said to them, these are the words I said to you while I was yet with you. That all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Or you can say concerning his name. Then beginning, again verse 45 sorry, then he opened it the understanding that they might understand it. Now look at 46 and 47 very slowly. Thus it is written and fulfilled that Christ, uh huh, and don't be hope Christ, sorry, to suffer and rise from the dead when the third day. Now let's take 47 together. Let's go. And that rep repentance and remission of sins should be preached where? In his name. Now, where did he get that name from? Sorry, where is he explaining it from? So the name of Jesus is firstly an Old Testament teaching. Let me see how you follow me. Are you following what I'm saying? It's an old, now, you know when I say Old Testament, it's for the purpose of reference, okay? Is that okay? Okay, it's a, an Old Testament teaching. And it's not saying that they should mention his name. Don't forget, his name is a popular name. The name Yeshua is a popular name. Even the name Emmanuel is a popular name. It wasn't a peculiar name, no. So when he says, in my name, or in his name, then in Matthew 28, verse 19, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, I question that interpretation, but let's leave it for now. Name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Then Mark 16. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. He that believes in his baptism shall be saved. He that believes shall be damned. This sign shall follow them that believe what? In my, look at the consistent. Consistency. In my name in where? Genesis to Malachi. Are you following this? Are you following this? Look at John 20.
In fact, John 1, 12 says, as many as received him, to them gave he what? Uh-huh. As many as believe in. Now, what does that mean? Emmanuel is a name of God's promise. Yeshua is a name of God's promise. So, how do you believe in his name that he is the fulfillment of that name? So, as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe that all those names are his own. Are you in church? Are you still there? So John 20. Yes, John again, 31. And this, John says, are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So, Jesus, common name. Why? It bears the promise that God made in the Old Testament books. So, Joshua, when Joshua bore the name, pay attention here, Yeshua, is because the nation of Israel was expecting God's deliverance. So, the parents named him according to that promise. Just like Noah Genesis 5.29, he's called Noah because God will comfort. It means comfort. And those names had why their functional uh, roles. Moses, how he was brought out of water. So, their culture, which is not your culture, so do not adopt it or else you become an idol worshiper. Their culture used names to speak of deities. That's why many of them carried the word E-L, Elohim, Eloha. That was their culture. And God, as we have studied this in this church, God used human culture. Human culture. He doesn't endorse it, but he uses it. So here's Jesus. He bears Yeshua. But he doesn't bear Yeshua as a promise. Is that very clear? Come on. He bears it as a fulfillment. So that's why John says, Jesus the Christ, <clears throat> the anointed one, the son of God. So, the name of Jesus is falsely understood by reading the Old Testament texts. When it says, in my name, as you have found it in the Old Testament. So what name is he saying? Because, look up guys, come on, look up guys. He can't be referring to Yeshua since it's a common name. Are you getting this? But he bore Yeshua because of the fulfillment role he's going to play. Now, it won't make sense, all right? Okay, let me put it this way. So, upon his resurrection, when he rose from the dead, it now became clear to them why he was given that name. It now became clear. So whatever stories Mary could not tell, because Mary couldn't tell the virgin bad story, you look funny. How would you be telling that, uh, what are you talking about? So upon the resurrection, the story of the virgin bad will now make sense. So it is the resurrection that validated that story. Without the resurrection, that story will be cock and boo. But the resurrection now places Jesus, who hitherto 
was a great man of God, preaching in the streets of Jerusalem, in Nazareth. He now places him in the fulfillment of prophecy. Oh, from that resurrection, then he must be this, that, and this. So the name of Jesus is not just spelling J-E-S-U-S. No, it's a common name. In fact, somebody played football yesterday. That was his name. And I saw a picture of Jesus wept. So that wasn't the point. There was even one guy like that. I remember Nigeria and Angola. It's not a very good game, I want to remember, but I got because I was in the stadium that, that, that time, the day Sam Okwaraji passed him. I think, yeah. And, you know, there was one of this guy. His name was Jesus. People were saying, I never saying that, <laughs> that this Jesus is silly. What can, and people were saying, okay, and I can't fire. Huh? <laughs> As a new creature. <laughs> but it didn't matter, really. It's just a common name, okay? Is that clear? All right. So we need to know what is the name. What is the name? All right? There's a common name. Yeshua. What is the name? Firstly, it is the fulfillment of that promise. Because the name Yeshua carries a promise, okay? Right? And Emmanuel carries a promise. Is it still a promise? No. It is now a fulfillment. So let's get back to names again. Genesis chapter 1. Are you learning something? The name of Jesus is not a wonder charm. No, it's not. No, it's not a wonder charm. It's not like, oh, Jesus! Or you used to call cake. After J E S U S. You're not saying demons are not fleeing. Why would they flee? When you are both playing the same field. You can now kiss the bride after Jesus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look at this now. Genesis 1. We've done it this before. The beginning, then the light and the darkness are spiritual realities. Let's focus on 3, 4, and 5. And God said, let there be light, which is the word I am. I am the light. That's a better way to say it. I am the light. And there was light. So everything we find in the Genesis account, God is the one. He is the seed, all right? He is the light, right? He is the land himself. He is the Shaddai. He is the land. So what, does, what happens here? He says, I am the light. And then there was light. I am the light. Just like Exodus 3.14. I am the light, I'll be what I'll be. I am the light. And there was light. Whatever we wanted God was, it became for us. I am, I am, I am the light. And there was light. Then he saw the light. And it was good. Then he divided it. The word badal, which we have seen, means to separate, consecrate the light from the darkness. Now pay attention to five. And God called the light day. Five. He called the light day. That means the light will function as what? I told you what quara, Q-A-R-A, is a functional word. The light is now to function as day. So, when you see it was called, to call is function. Adam to call the animals. I told you it is not a biology class. That is why, or zoology class, that is why the first animal that was described was a serpent, Soto. So, the animals there describe human actions. Human activities. A serpent is for subtility. It's not a zoological class. We're in a spiritual class. So you find in the Old Testament books, animals were used to describe human conduct. Dragon, lion, sheep. So that's functional. So the light he called day. Then the darkness he called night. And he separated, which is for consecration and holiness, which is what he told Israel. He separated the light from the darkness. We are called out of darkness where? Into his, are you there? We were sometimes darkness. We are now light. Let me see if you're following this now. So it's functional. 
So if I call you light, I don't think you mean I saw a bulb on you. It's functional. It's your function, your role. So when we call the name of Jesus, what is the name that we are calling? Don't forget, it's not J-E-S-U-S because that is a regular name. Just like light is a regular thing. In Nigeria, amen. But you know what I'm trying to say, right? Remember the first time I, I went to Southern Africa, they took me to one very nice girl, and it was nice in that day. And, I, and then one whole day, no up nepa. I didn't feel good. Two days, no up nepa. I began to feel, I didn't know good to take light. You know, <laughs> very funny, right? So, you know, it's not that light. Okay? So, when he says, he called the light day, it's functional. Just like Adam is functional, Eve is functional. All those names, for example, are Hebrew words, and Adam and Eve were not Hebrew. So, we're looking at God's word here. So, what is the name of Jesus? What is the name? Is it making sense? Is it making sense? What is the name of Jesus? Can we say new covenant? Huh? Can we say new covenant? Without flow? flow? Without flow? New covenant? Huh? Is new covenant okay? That means God renewing his word. The name of Jesus is that God's word is faithful. In spite of people, it remains unbroken. New covenant. Because he is the messenger of it, right? Come on. Right? It's a new covenant messenger. He's a new covenant person. Okay? So, new covenant is the name of Jesus. So, when I say, in the name of Jesus, I'm saying, in the new covenant. Hallelujah. Glory to God. In the name of Jesus. I'm saying, in the new covenant. Because that's his function, right? Come on, come on. Now, it's not about mentioning it. It's about using it. We're going to see the difference later on. It's not mentioning it. Remember those guys uh, who were calling out demons in the name of Jesus? And then a demon came out and said, Jesus, I know, Paul, I know. Where did I meet you? But the Greek is like, Jesus, I know, Paul, I'm acquainted with. I saw Paul somewhere. He cast me out somewhere. Who are you? And then they beat the hell out of them. You know, so it's not about mentioning J-E-S-U-S, no. And after that word, after that time, the Bible says, so mightily grew the word of God. The word of God. And prevailed. We'll see that meaning later. And prevailed. Which means, the name of Jesus is the word of God. The word of God. The logos of God. The word of God. The word of God. Hallelujah. Are you in church? The word of God. So in Exodus chapter 3, Emmanuel means God with us. Yeshua means God, Yahweh delivers. And I explained the word Yasha to you. Can you remember? To take out of and take where? into. Are you with me? Come on. To take out of and into. So that means Jesus does just, doesn't just deliver us, he also leads us, okay? That's the word Yasha. He leads us. So Exodus chapter 3 we find God whom we are going to identify whether Jesus was here as well. Let's see it later, later on. It says in verse 14. So when, when Moses said, what is your name? Now, listen carefully. We said names are functional. Right? Names are functional. So when he said, what is your name? Please look up. If you were, not, if you were sleeping before, sleep now. Walai. Um, I've forgotten the phrase. Oh. 
uh, forgotten my lines. Okay. Now, if you were sleeping, just sleep. I'll, I'll allow you to sleep. Seriously. Okay. Now, the true of Israel, they are not hearing about God for the first time. Right? No, they are not. Because, in fact, he said to Abraham, the reason why they knew they are Jews, because they have a common God. They have a common deity. That's why they are brothers. Now, they've been good in Egypt, no doubt. But when God spoke to Moses, he said, I am the God of your fathers. And when Moses went there, he said, the God of our fathers. They knew who he was talking about. So why did he say, what is your name? Names are what? Huh? Functional. What do you want to do? Is that very clear? Is that very clear? Is that very clear? What do you want to do? Then he said, tell them, I am that I am. That's the first thing he said. Now I'm going to give you a small Hebrew lesson. I am that I am. Then he said to them, thou shalt say to the Israel, I am that sent me. Now, in the first instance, he uses a present perfect tense. I am. The second time, I will be. Now, when he said, I am, and I will be, the word Yahweh, of course, Jews can fight over what I just did now, because for the reverence of that, they don't put, um, what do you call it now, vowels in it. So there has no sound, because of the reverence they have. Because in the Hebrew, that word is a verb. I will be. Which, I'll be what? I will be, I am. I am what? I'll be. Then he says to them, the God of your fathers sent me, this is my name forever, this is my memorial unto all generations. Next verse chapter 6. Look at the clarity. And verse 2. I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Pay attention as God Almighty. We saw that, right? Which is the word wide land, Shaddai. A wide land. So, the land God promised was himself. I am God Almighty. Now, I'm here to fulfill my promise. Ends the word, I am. Let's just run through a few things. We'll continue from there next week. Then he says to them, the first thing he says, in verse 6, Exodus 6, I'll bring you out from under the borders of the Egyptians. I'll read you out of their bondage. I'll redeem you with a stretched out hand with great judgments. Deliverance, redemption. Then verse 7, I will take you to me for a people. I will take you to me. I will be to you a God. You shall know that I am the Lord that brings you from out under. So, look at this. No, don't miss this one. He saves us so that we can have him. So, the gift of redemption is who? God himself. Is the gift of redemption. I'll be God. You will be my people. Then it says, I will bring you to the land. Okay? That land will exploit. So you have one, redemption, sanctification, deliverance, and the land. The name of Jesus, therefore, functions in this promise. Or the name of Jesus functions as this word, this promise. Yesterday, if you were in the teaching session, we said that the setting of the entire Bible is a Genesis and Exodus. Remember that yesterday. We were here yesterday. And we said that is the way we can interpret scripture to the whole world. 
We'll continue from that, you know, next time. Make sure you pay attention. So Jesus, as a new covenant messenger, is to bring God's promise to pass, not only in Israel, but the whole world. That is why it says, among all nations. So every nation, look up guys, this is crazy, huh? don't lose this one. Every nation will take the gospel, God is taking them to the land. That land cannot be that Israel. Though. That's clear, Abby. Even they themselves, they've not been able to take. The <laughs> so always understand, land there is archetypal. It's a figure of speech. So the gospel is about the gift of a land. Is that clear? An inheritance, a deliverance, and the land is God himself. So the name of Jesus is the name of that covenant. The name of the land, the name of the promise. So we cannot explore fully the meaning of the name of Jesus without a precise understanding of the Old Testament. The name of Jesus gives us that access to go back and read Genesis to Malachi and see what his name does. Look at Philippians 2. Quickly. I've skipped a part of my note for this purpose because it's going to take a longer time, but I believe next week I'll get on it. Philippians 2. Look at what Paul says. And verse 5. Let this man be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. Verse 6. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God had highly exalted him, now listen to this, lose this, lose this, and giving him a name above all names. The name above all names has to be God's name. That at the name of Jesus, which is above all names, every knee shall bow of things in heaven, things in the earth, and things under the earth, and every tongue, Philippians 2.10, shall confess. That Jesus Christ is what? Lord. Or the Old Testament, Yahweh. Or Adonai, to the glory of God the Father. Paul is reading to us, we close here, Isaiah 45, verse 23. Like I said earlier, you cannot know, you cannot know the name of Jesus without understanding the Old Testament. It's the name in the Old Testament. Isaiah 45. Look at it in 21. Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together who had declared this from ancient time, who had told you from that time. Have I not the Lord? He says, there's no God else beside me, a just God, a Savior, there is none beside me. Put your hands there and go to chapter 42. I am the Lord, verse 8. That is my name. My glory will I not give to another. My glory will I not give to another. I won't give my name to anybody. I won't give my name to anybody. But what is happening here? Paul has gone back to read Isaiah 45. In 22. Look unto me. Isaiah 45. And be ye saved. All the ends of the earth. For I am God. And there is none else. I have sworn by myself. The word is gone. Out of mine mouth in righteousness. Shall not return. That unto me. Every knee shall bow. And every tongue. Shall swear. So God, the name that was given to Jesus, right?
means that in the resurrection, they saw God. That is the God of Israel. That's the God of the Old Testament. Paul saw that on the road to Damascus. Just like Moses in Exodus 3, God speaks to Paul directly. He said to Moses, I am. He said to Paul, I am Jesus. Yahweh, Yesha. Paul went back to reread the Old Testament and he found out that the Jesus he persecuted was God. Hence, Paul said, Let that mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. Jesus is the one we're going to see when we reread the Old Testament again. And when we come back to pick it up and say, In the name of Jesus, we see that what he did is still does today. Learn something? Stand to your feet, lift your hands. Bless him.